that I'm standing between uh, you and alcohol. So uh, I'll, try, I'll try not to, uh, to waste any of your uh, precious time. Uh, my name is Joe Ziegler. I am a technical evangelist for uh, Amazon, specifically for the ANZ region. As you can tell from my accent, I'm not originally from New Zealand. I am, of course, Australian. <laughs> so they let anybody in these days. So what I want to talk a little bit about, uh, my background, I'm a developer. I started off in the, uh, well, way back, my first job was actually at Netscape. So that was all C. Uh, I did Java. I moved over to the uh, C Sharp .NET world. And then um, when I was doing some of my own startups, and I had to pay for stuff out of my own pocket, I went to the open source world. And I got, that's how I got into Python. And so I've done uh, maybe about two years of Python. So I'm sure most of you in this room are much better at it than I am. So uh, be, be easy on me when I show you my examples. Um, but uh, I think we've got a really good story for Python and AWS. Uh, the interfaces and the APIs work quite well with Python. The uh, person who actually wrote the main library, which is called Boto, uh, we, we hired him, and he works out of Seattle now. And so we were really heavily invested on the Python side. Um, so if you guys have any questions or, you, or anything, just interrupt me while I'm going along here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Elastic Beanstalk. Hopefully this works. Oh, my battery died. Oh, well. So um, let's try this. Here we go. We'll just couple, cover a few subjects about Elastic Beanstalk, what it is, why you want to use it, uh, how you use it for Python, and uh, specifically I have examples uh, set up for uh, Python and Django, and then I've got some demos. And actually I think one thing I'll do right before I kick off here is, let's see here. We'll go ahead. And just, uh, let's see. What I'll do is I've got a, a distributed denial of service attack I'm going to do on my Django service while I'm talking, as one does. Now let me just get in there real quick. See that? Okay, cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, as an example, oh shoot, I got logged off the network real quick. Hold on. <laughs> I need my credentials. My swag bag. There we go. What I'm going to show you is um, how my Django website scales up by itself and manages uh, elasticity. XEM. So what I'm going to use actually is a, uh, it's actually, it, it's a Python application. It's made by the Chicago Tribune. It's called uh, Bees with Machine Guns. <laughs> and what it's going to do is we're going to bring up a whole bunch of EC2 instances to attack my Django site. Let me see if i got a good setting here. Let's bring up 10. There we go. Cool. 
This is one of my favorite apps, by the way. It's open source. You can use it, too. Just Google uh, bees with machine guns. And what that's going to do is actually it's, it's going to create a distributed denial of service attack uh, on my website. Please don't use it on somebody else's website, or your experience with AWS will be quite short. I guarantee you that. But these guys are going to get kicked off here. What I'll do also... is I will show you my EC2 stuff while we're talking. So, my bees are actually sitting in, in Singapore. So what's happening over here is these are the bees. See them? And they're ready to attack. So what we'll do is we'll attack my beanstalk site while we're talking. Let's do quite a few. All right. Oops. Not wrong there. Get my girl for my thing here. is going to be my, my really cool pull application, which no one's ever seen before, ever, who's ever used Django. And we'll attack that. There they go. All right, so we'll talk while this is happening. And what we'll see later is my uh, Django stuff is actually sitting in Tokyo. Okay. There. So you see there's just one little instance running. As I talk, they'll start growing. All right. So, what is Elastic Beanstalk? So, Elastic Beanstalk is a container that uh, Amazon has, and it's a container which manages uh, different web services. So, originally it uh, launched for Java, and we've added uh, support for PHP and .NET. And as of uh, last week, we, we launched Python support. So any kind of Python application which is using the WSGI interface can be fully managed with, uh, uh, with this container service, with Beanstalk, Elastic Beanstalk. So what do you get out of this? So has anyone ever used a service like Heroku before? Yeah? So they do Python now, right? So that's basically the same thing as Beanstalk. Whereas though Heroku actually runs on top of AWS, it, it actually, they cover everything up where you don't have access to kind of everything that's running underneath it. With this particular product, we'll manage all the complexity. Uh, we'll, we'll distribute your, uh, your application across different machines, but you can still kind of go underneath it, and if you know how to use AWS, you can manage really the specific controls over each different service. So you're able to kind of get rid of all that complexity of having a really scalable app, of taking advantage of the cloud, without losing any of that kind of control. So what it is, is it's really just a, a collection of different kinds of services. So underneath it all, is our basic EC2 service, which is our compute service. And it's based on an AMI, which is actually a Linux uh, image. It's a, the Amazon uh, Linux distro, which is all set and, and set up to run uh, Python and with an Apache front end. It uses different scripts, which are uh, run by CloudFormation, which is an orchestration service, which will help bring up a bunch of different things. 
Uh, on the back end, it has a cloud watch. So you can see, see all your services going up and down. You can see your CPU usage, your disk space use, usage. Um, it also has the ability to use our relational database service. So if you're using MySQL and you don't want to have to set up your own database, you can use our uh, database service in that case. It'll connect everything to a load balancer. It'll auto-scale everything up and down. And that's pretty much what I'm going to show you do in, in, in just a second. So why would you kind of want to do this? Why would you want to use this service? Well, interestingly enough, it's, it's free. Kind of. So it, as a service itself, it actually has no, no cost. But you will be paying for the same Amazon you know, EC2 instances and, and everything you would consume if you were to use this service, or not use this service, but actually run all these different things yourself directly. Versus something like Heroku, who is actually running on top of Amazon, you're obviously going to be paying a little bit extra on top of that to cover their costs. So. What you'll be able to do with it is you can do change management and deployment management, right? So what, what happens is you're actually interfacing with Elastic Beanstalk via Git. I would I would have preferred uh, uh, to use Bitbucket myself because a Bitbucket, of course, on the back end is Mercurial, which is of course Python. But uh, I didn't get to choose that, so it's Git. And what that means you can do is if you've got an environment, for example, and you're doing continuous integration or agile development, and you've got uh, a continuous integration server running, you could actually control your deployment out into production, right? So you could have everything go through all the different levels of test, and when you want to deploy your Django app, or pretty much any Python app that, that interfaces correctly, you can have it push it out to the, the production environment. And you don't have to worry about all this complexity. You don't have to worry about how many servers you have set up. You can make sure that everything's tested, uh, everything works. And you can actually set up lots of different kinds of environments in, in Beanstalk. So you can actually have your app running in, in different types of configurations and then kind of point to it in different ways. So, what do you get out of it? Well, uh, when you use Beanstalk, everything's secure by default. So there's a, there's a DMZ already set up. Uh, there's these security groups, all these Amazon uh, security uh, settings already set up so that you know, only port 80 or port 80 and 443 is open on the front end. Nobody can get into the system. It uses SSH in order to be able to shell in the different EC2 instances. You're going to get elasticity. So you're going to be able to set up these rules automatically so that if your website is in a lot of use, it's going to bring up more compute power and it's going to scale out horizontally for you without effort, right? And the other thing it's going to do is it's going to allow it to scale back down, which reminds me, let's see how the bees are doing real quick. Oh, the bees have attacked. What do we have? Let's see how my website's doing. A little blurry. Ah, you see? Now I have twice as many servers running as I did before. Let's attack more. I don't have to pay for it. It's Jeff, Jeff's money. There we go. The man has spaceships. So the important part of that elasticity, which is a great thing about using cloud services, anybody's cloud services, is that as I scale down, I'm returning those resources back to Amazon. So I'm not paying anymore. So right now, technically, I'm paying for twice as much for my website as I was uh, when I started the presentation, because uh, I have twice the capacity. But what will happen eventually, as we're talking, is these machines are going to start turning off. And no one's actually going to know that. Um, if, you actually go to, if you go to the app, you'll be able to see it. Here, I'll show it to you real quick. So if we go here, this is my uh, Django app. As it's scaling up and down, and it's under attack right now with a, a, a distributed denial of service attack, you can see it's still pretty, pretty peppy. And I'll just tick everyone off here in the audience and vote for Ruby. <laughs> so. Is it very squeaky chair? <laughs> if the chairs are rocking. So you're, get, you're also going to get environment management. So with, with Amazon, one of the things we stress is that uh, everything in our system is an, a, an API. And certainly everything in, in our system is an API, which can be controlled from Python. So you're going to get the ability to have infrastructure as code. So in this case, you can describe your whole uh, production environment or your testing environment or your staging environment as infrastructure as code. You describe it to Elastic Beanstalk, and you can push your, uh, your application to these different environments. Right? And lastly, we have uh, different tools to make it so it's highly available. 
So as these instances are, are actually launching in the background, they're connecting to an elastic load balancer. That elastic load balancer is already highly available. Now we've got this concept of regions in, at Amazon. And a region basically is a geographical location that we've got services. So right now I'm using the region in Tokyo to host my application. I'm using Singapore to attack it. Um, yeah, maybe I should have done it the other way around, considering my history. <laughs> um, but uh, what's actually happening is these instances are actually starting in physical different data centers. And they're spread across these different data centers. They're connected together with high, uh, uh, low latency uh, private connectivity. Right? So if one of these data centers goes down in Tokyo, my application is actually going to stay up. Right? On the back end, it's using our uh, relational database service, RDS. And that relational database service, if I choose to, I can actually help make that more highly available by clicking this option, and it runs across these two different availability zones. And so what will happen in that case is in the background, the one main database is running. There's a, basically a hot standby sitting in another data center that's kept in sync. So, so it's doing a synchronous uh, block replication of this other uh, database. If for some reason, as my app points to this one database, if something happens to that data center or to that database and it goes down, the endpoint will get moved over to this other database. Right? So that's a click of a button to set up. You don't have to do that yourself. So let me show you a little bit. I'll show you um, a little bit what's specific for Beanstalk and uh, Python and Django. So it's going to support uh, Python 2.6 right now. Uh, I do not know if there's any comment on being able to support uh, Python 3, but uh, <laughs> That's been in the works for a little while, anyway. Uh, we've got a 32-bit and 64-bit Amazon Linux that you can use. Um, all the deployment's actually through Git. Uh, on the back end, you can, you can absolutely use your own database for your application. However, if you want to, you can just tell your application to use our relational database service. It's MySQL, uh, and you can build your app up on that. Um, it also has a bunch of configuration uh, options and bootstrap options. Uh, that I'll show you here in just a second if you have some very specific things that you're trying to do with your application. So let me um, just kind of show you what I wrote and how it works. Do not make fun of my code. And I, I am using PyCharm, by the way, just so everyone knows. Let's give myself a break here. Okay, so here's what my application looks like, right? So it's a very, the very, very basic polling app. The bees give up again? Oh well. I survived the attack. Oh, not only that, we've, we've scaled up and we've scaled down. So what happened is I scaled up to deal with the attack, and then once the attack was over, my rules that are set in Beanstalk had actually turned off the instances. So now I'm just paying for one instance. All right. So here's basically what it looks like. So I created this app. It's a basic Django app. It's not that exciting. We've got a couple of things that we can do with it. So the first thing that I can do is I can, I can configure how my, uh, my Python environment is set up. And so I can issue commands. This is the bootstrapping for the instances as they start up, right? Now, one thing I can do is I can guarantee that the command is only issued once. So if you've got something that's, you know, especially dealing with the database, when you deploy the application, you only want to be this, the one machine to actually interface with it, as opposed to perhaps, like, the collect statics command, which I'd want to run across all the different servers as they come up. So this is a little bit of your bootstrapping area. You can also put uh, some yum commands in here. So if you have specific software that you want to get installed in that instance as it fires up, you'd include it in this file. And then there's a few uh, Python environment settings that I can set up here. So there's my settings file. Uh, there's the path to my configuration, um, processes, and threads. Right? Then I can actually configure Elastic Beanstalk in, inside of my application. So in this case, I called my application PyCon, and I have an what's called an application environment. And I'll show that in the interface in, in a little bit. And that's basically, that's actually the container that my app is running in. 
I'm running this out of Tokyo, and I've set it up to use uh, RDS, for example. And then I've got a few basic settings for the actual application here, so um, the user for RDS, um, some basic settings for auto scaling on, and, and uh, uh, health checks for the load balancer and everything. All this stuff, though, you can actually do it through the interface. Then I've got my regular, you know, my basic run-of-the-mill general uh, Django application, which isn't that exciting. I've got my requirements file, so it uses pip underneath. It gets kicked off, so you can go ahead and do a pip freeze and throw everything into into the your requirements.txt file, and it'll <laughs> kick that off and bootstraps everything. Uh, and it works with a virtual environment too, if you want to use that. Um, and then the one thing that I've got set up here is we pass environmental variables down. So in this case, I'm using SQLite in my development environment, but when it actually goes out to production, the container will pass that down. And so I can switch it so it's using RDS in the background. So I'll show you how it looks. So this is my actual uh, Elastic Beanstalk application. And all of this is, every, everything with Amazon, everything that's in that web UI, it's all available uh, via uh, the APIs. So normally the way that I interface with, with Amazon Web Services is I use IPython and Boto. And I find that's actually a lot easier for me to do. It's got auto-completion. I'm quite, I'm quite a crappy ty typist, uh, most of my development. Uh, fortune came from copy and paste, to be honest with you. Uh, but um, So anything I'm showing you right here, you can absolutely do it program programmatically, and you can repeat it, and you can put it into source control and use it over and over again. So I can pick my different instance types to run everything. Um, I can pick key pairs for me to uh, SSH into the uh, system if I want to. I've got the load balancer all set up. For right now, I'm using port 80. Uh, it's actually going to ping the application and see if the app's healthy. So it's going to ping it right now. It's going to check it every five seconds. And if that app doesn't come back with something healthy, it's going to actually start a new instance up. So one of the things I could even do, too, while I'm showing you this, is I could take the app down. I'm going to stop it instead of terminating it. So pretty soon there'll be some alarms that are going to go off and it'll bring the application back up. Now the thing that makes things quite interesting is the auto-scaling. And so for right now, what I've done is I've told it that I want to always have at least one uh, Django app always running, app server, the EC2 instance. Usually what you'd want to do is, is probably say two for redundancy, but let's say I'm very poor because I'm a startup, maybe I'll just do it as one. And then I can tell it the maximum number of instances that I ever want it to run. So um, we've got customers that have that in the tens of thousands of numbers. So Netflix, for example, they scale up and down quite a bit in the U.S., right? At peak, they use 25% of the Americans' uh, uh, Internet traffic. But it's a very jagged type uh, 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 graph. And so they'll scale up and down automatically like that, but they'll do it in tens of thousands of instances. Now what it's going to do is as it's creating these instances, it's going to put these across the two availability zones in Japan which are basically those, those clusters of data centers. So it's going to spread my application across uh, several physical locations. And the way I want it to determine how to add more apps is it's going to be CPU usage on, each, uh, on the aggregate of the EC2 instances. So for here, for example, if all my EC2 instances together are using about 80% CPU, I'm going to want it to kick off another instance. So I have it actually just add one more instance every time that happens. Conversely, if it drops below 50% CPU, I have it start killing off instances. But you can use different metrics on that. You can say latency. Sure. Can, can you scale the size of that? So scaling uh, vertically versus horizontally. Yeah, so I've got a, I've got a thing that's not very cloudy. Yeah. Uh, it won't auto scale well that way because you're going to have to restart the instance to scale up that way. 
You couldn't, well, yeah, you, you, you probably couldn't. What you can, you can do is you could do it programmatically. You could say, for example, if you've got an app that needs a really big server during the day, you could have it run as a large instance and then maybe at 5 p.m. or something switch to a smaller one. But as our auto scale works, it actually is made to scale out this way because for most clients, eventually you get to that level of granularity where up doesn't make any difference anymore. So, yeah. Yeah, what you can do is uh, we've got a DNS service. It's called Route 53, and it's got latency-based routing on it. And what you can do in that case is you can have it aim towards the servers that are closest to your customers, and then just let the model scale up and down. Uh, that, that will sort out where the traffic goes. Yes. Will it sort out where the instances come? Well, you just connect it to auto-scaling. So you've got one instance sitting in every place around the world, and then once it starts to get too much traffic, it'll start to scale those up. So Dropbox, AWS, Python, S3, worldwide availability, that's how they do it, for example, yep. Um, in this case, I've got it connected to the, the, uh, our managed MySQL database. If I wanted to, I could spread that data, database across different availability zones. That database is backed up. Every few seconds, a snapshot's taken about it. Um, I can get notifications of anything that's going wrong. Um, and if I want to, I can log everything up into uh, S3. So let's just take a look real quick. Let's see if it's up. So let's see if it... Because it might take a little bit to bootstrap it. Nothing can, nothing can go alive, but a wrong in a live environment. Let's see. It hasn't brought it back up yet. But it knows, it knows that it's broken. So the one thing is, it will take it to some time to bootstrap and bring up another image. So we'll just restart that one then. So in the background, what it's doing is uh, it's, it's taking an Amazon machine image, or an AMI as we call it, which is a basic, it's a basic image with uh, Amazon Linux on it. And as it needs to create new instances, it's going to launch that Im image. It's going to bootstrap it based upon those configuration settings that I just showed you. So it's going to do a yum install, whatever packages, and it'll do a pip install of all the different uh, Python packages. It'll bring it up. It'll check to see if it's healthy. And then as it becomes healthy, it connects it into that load balancer. And so it's pretty seamlessly going to, going to be able to scale up and down in the background. Does anyone else have any other questions about it? If you're writing, if you're writing something on Django, you can really just, uh, as one person, as a small team, you can create a very big globally uh, distributed application in no time. Um, just no administration really on your own end. Let's see, we'll reconnect here in a sec. We'll let that run. And you can see too, just on my side, there's not a lot of configuration that I had to do on my own side. I mean, of course, you want to use a requirements file regardless of whether you're using AWS or not. Uh, you basically just have these few configuration files here. On the back end, I can show you this too real quick. If I wanted to change something, so being, being from Texas, of course, I originally put howdy in there. But since I'm going to be in Australia for the rest of my life, we'll switch that one. And I'll show you how easy it is to deploy it out. So we'll add it to my Git repository. There we go. <laughs> and then I push it out. Regardless of the number of machines that I have running, it's going to consistently push that out. I really don't even have to care about it anymore. Over here, It's all checked into uh, Elastic Beanstalk. And what it'll do is now deploy that out to all my different machines. So if I added some new uh, dependencies, for example, if I installed some new modules, as long as that's within my, my requirements.txt, that'll get, also get pushed out. Uh, and I can have multiple of these environments running, too. So I could have, for example, PyCon production environment, PyCon staging environment, right? 
check everything in from Git, have it go to staging, and then I can switch my DNS so that I can promote uh, staging into production. Uh, also, while this is actually happening, let's see here. We should be back up here. Assuming that I'll come back up. While it's actually going to be pushing these out, it's not going to take down the environment. So it's actually bringing up an exact copy of everything in production at this time. It'll bring it all up, make sure it's all healthy, and only then when it passes uh, all the checks, it'll point this uh, DNS over to uh, the new uh, production environment. It's just taking a little time because I shut, I shut it down, and for sake of brevity, it's probably not going to have enough time to, to do all the checks and bring up the whole new instance, but we'll let it run. Does anybody have any questions while I'm doing this? It's good? good. Make it's exercise. <laughs> Just a question about pricing. Yes. Yep. Um, how does reserved instance pricing sort of fit in with the horizontal scaling? <laughs> this is not a very Python question, is it? <laughs> so reserved instance. So to frame the question, at Amazon we have three different pricing models. So the majority of your costs are usually going to be compute instances. Most people are used to paying those on an hourly basis, on-demand instances. We actually have two other ways that you can buy instance uh, types. You can do uh, what's called reserved instances, and that basically you're, you, you pay us either a year or three years in advance a certain fee, and that instance is now reserved for you, and you get it at a much reduced rate. Sometimes it's 72% cheaper. Um, the other way is what we call a spot market. So we've got spot instances, so if you're actually doing a lot of processing, Spot instances are, are excess capacity. And you can usually get that at 25% to 33% of the cost of our on-demand instances. The caveat being we, we can take it away anytime we want. So it's really good for parallel processing, for data crunching. Um, but it's not so good for, uh, for example, hooking up to your life support system. I would, I would not do that. Well, maybe for your mother-in-law. Uh, 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 so the answer is for reserved instances, it's just purely an accounting function. When you buy a reserved instance, if you have any instance that's running and matches to what that reserved instance is, you'll be charged less. So it doesn't matter what capacity in auto scaling you can do. It. You can also use spot instances for auto scaling. So if you've got some really jagged traffic and you might burst up a lot and you think, hey, maybe I need to have like 10 extra instances, but I don't want to pay for them that much for them, you can try to do it with spot. And if you're able to get the, the, the price, it will, it will auto scale those up. Um, the the deployments. Sure. Uh, how does it handle database migrations when you put things out in production? Uh, I'm thinking using something like South, for instance. And if you've got more than one Django uh, server instance, how do they share static files? Uh, not the CSS or JavaScript, but uploaded user files. Well, I mean. For Beanstalk, you're still going to have to use the same methodology. For the database migration, you're still going to have to do the same methodology as you would without using Beanstalk. And so what you probably end up doing is, do, is setting up a south migration inside that configuration file, which will get run at the beginning once for every deployment. Um, as far as static files go, what, what's, the, what's kind of the specific scenario? Like you have two different apps running in two different Django installations, or you're using several apps in one Django? or? <coughs> Yep. 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 So there's a there's a great S3 uh, plugin for Django, and so you can have it all go to the same S3 bucket, and then you can put our, our content delivery network in front of it, which is uh, CloudFront. And so you refer to your static. Your statics will actually be the CloudFront location. That's how I've done it. Yeah. Anybody else? Did we come back up yet with my new after H? There we go. So there, there it is. And actually, it would be quite quick if I didn't shut off that server like I did. So you can go in there and. What I don't. What do you say? What do you say in New Zealand? You don't have a good day. What do you have? What what? Well, instead of hello, what do you have? Hello. Just hello. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're sort of reaching the end of time. But I'd like to thank Joe very much for this presentation today. It's time for beer, right? Yeah. Thank you.